So, uh, good morning. Thanks for coming. Before we start, Java developers. Who here develops Java? Excellent. Who's using Java 9? 8? 7? 6? 5? 4? 3, 2, any before 6? There's always somebody there that's just a shame to raise their hands. So, um, initial disclaimer, everything I say about the future, it's plans, subject to change, so don't hold me to it. We may change our plans. About me. So I'm a director of product management with the Java Platform Group at Oracle. Before joining Oracle, actually I didn't join Oracle, I was acquired by Oracle. I was part of the Sun team. Uh, so I was also in the Java product management team, not handling the JDK before then. I, anybody ever heard of the Java store and the Java warehouse? So there's like one guy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's what I did before joining uh, Oracle. After that, around 2010, I was moved as the product manager first of the Java libraries, and a few years after that, of the whole Java standard edition. So I wrote the product requirement documents for JDK 7 and 8. We don't use that mechanism anymore for Java 9 and above, so there's no product requirement documents for JDK 9. I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, before that, well, Sun Microsystems product management. That's it about me. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the new release model. This was announced slightly before the release of Java 9, so a few months before that. The idea is no more limousines, think trains. And what do I mean with that? In the previous model, we had these, what we call release drivers, the key features that we decided this is what's going to make this release interesting. And we decided that when we were done with the prior one, so when we were done with JDK 7, a few months before actually, a bunch of people got together and we decided, hey, here are the things that we want for JDK 8, and yeah, let's aim for that. Now, some were the release drivers, and those were the big, you know, the VIP feature, and after that, everything else that can fit within that schedule. And when you develop like that, as you probably have already discovered, as you get closer to the release, you know, two years into the future, yeah, everything can be done, right? The closer you get, you realize, we're not gonna make this feature, and if it was not a release driver, we just push it out until the next release. But if it was a release driver, now we have a problem, right? And that meant that you could either hold the whole release for that one feature, even though some other features were ready, or kicked out one of the release drivers, neither of which is pretty. So that was the limousine, right? Until the major feature was ready, everybody waits. Now we're thinking more trains. They just go out, the important thing is the schedule, and if you don't meet one release, you'll get to the next one. So how do we get there? The previous model, the model was a major release about every two years, okay? and we support it for a very long time. So you know, you create this very nice stack of releases that were available at any point in time. Now if you zoom in and look at it, during the first year and a half, now some people didn't notice, we had minor updates. And we planned and delivered three minor updates for every major release, okay? And those were spaced six months apart. So, under the old model, we had eight, eight update 20, eight update 40, eight update 60. Six months apart. Uh, don't get me started on the versioning. You know, that's a sore point for some of us. Uh, we came up with something a little bit more logical with nine. So under the old model, we would have released nine six months after the last update for eight and after that, six months, 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, you notice that what gets into steady mode is not the GA version, right? So once we went from 8 to 8U20, there is no more updates to the 8 line. Now there's updates to the 8U20 line. So when people think, oh, 8 is available for a long time, in my head I'm thinking 8U60 
is supported for a long time. Okay, minor distinction, but it'll become important in a minute. And so this is the plan, okay? But of course, you know what happens, right? Uh, Jigsaw wasn't ready. We had to delay it a couple of times. So those two years turned into three years. And, you know, that's significant. You know, you, you just delay the whole thing, including a bunch of uh, features for a whole new year. And, you know, I don't show it here, but eight was, of course, three years after the release of seven. So even though the goal was every two years, in reality, we ended up slipping 50% you know, of the time. That's not too good. But we realized, given that in theory, we have a mechanism for delivering new functionality and features every six months, why not do that, right? Now, when we were using 9, 9.1, 9.2, you cannot change the API on a minor update. That's just part of the JCP rules. So we could only do certain things on those update releases. And we figure, yeah, we, we don't want to do that. We want to make it so that every feature, when it's ready, it just gets added to that release whenever it's ready. So let's not call it about anything. Let's say 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And have them on a six-month schedule. Okay. Now, the gentleman here asked me a question. How do you support these? Well, we cannot support six-month releases for each one for eight or nine years. That would create an unmanageable stack of backports every time we want to fix a security vulnerability. So, you know, again, we, we didn't invent anything here. We just borrow from what, uh, you know, other platforms and operating systems do. And we introduce the concept of long-term support. So every few releases, we'll just, you know, I dub you the long-term support option, and we will support that one for a very long time. Okay? Next question is, of course, how often do you have these long-term releases? And remember when I said that we were landing on three years between majors? Well, three years between LTS releases. Okay. So now we have 9 and 10, 10 just coming out. Probably by now, if you search the download page, it'll say JDK 10. 11 is going to be our next LTS release, and that will be supported for a very long time. Then we have three more years until the next LTS, 17. Far? So good? Clear? Good. This is not retroactive. We already had some commitments. We're not going to you know, say, well, 8 is no longer LTS for 7 or 6. So 6 and 7 remain, and 8, remain supported for as long as they were supported when they launched. Okay? Now, that's just the release cadence. There is a more subtle, though for me at least, an even more important change, which is JDK releases versus open JDK releases. So the way that we used to develop Java in Oracle was we developed most of the source code in an open source repository called OpenJDK. But OpenJDK, we didn't produce binaries from it. We would grab OpenJDK, we would add layer on top commercial features that were only available for Oracle, and we would release that as the Oracle JDK. So up to and including JDK 8, Oracle JDK is a superset of what was available in OpenJDK. Now, other Java vendors would also grab the code from OpenJDK, do their own thing, right? Replace the JVM with their own, like IBM does, or offer different garbage collection algorithms that we didn't, and in some cases, charge for that, much like Oracle JDK did. So we came up with this binary, the Oracle JDK, and we released it under a license called the Binary Code License, which had two purposes. It was meant for customers, but it was also meant to be available to the community that didn't want to pay for the license. And it had some restrictions to allow for that. So if you read the binary code license, it'll say things like, it's free to use in a general purpose computer. But if you want to put it on a printer, or on a kiosk, or on an ATM, that you need to license. 
right? It also had constraints about how could you redistribute it. And it included all these commercial features that you couldn't use unless you license the JDK from Oracle. And for the vast majority of developers, they just ignore that because, hey, most people use it on a general purpose computer. They don't care about the commercial features. But for a handful, this was really troublesome. So as part of this announcement, we said, let's make it very clear. First of all, we're going to start producing open JDK binaries, not just the Oracle JDK binaries. Now, we didn't do this on time so that you know, all of those commercial features that were available only in Oracle, they're not yet there, and that's why that little blue box on nine is smaller. It's not that I cannot diagram, right? With 10, it gets a little closer, and the goal is by the time we reach JDK 11, all of those commercial features that George talked about will now be available in OpenJDK and therefore available to anybody that grabs OpenJDK binaries. Okay? That's good. When we get to that point, we're no longer going to offer the JDK under the current license. We're going to have the Oracle JDK under Oracle standard terms, and for everybody else, OpenJDK binaries under GPL, which is the license under which most of you get Linux. So, you know, it has, it's an open source license. All good? Excellent. Either you all follow me or you're just like, I hope the first. So, another way of thinking of this, or the way I like to see it is, I now have a continuous stream of open JDK binaries. That's what I expect most people will use. That has new functionality added every six months. And it's just tip of the line. When 10 comes out, we no longer produce updates for nine. When 11 comes out, we're done with 10. Notice that in the top line, when 12 comes out, we're done with 11. So that's the, you know, we're trying to create two different binaries for two different use cases. Developers want new features. They want new functionality. They cannot wait three years for the next version of anything. On the other hand, enterprises tend to prefer to stay on the same release for a very long time. When I ask that question about um, who's using JDK 6, this is mostly a developer audience. When I do the same session for large companies, I get a lot of people raising their hands when I say five or even four. There's a few that raise their hands when I say two. We haven't supported that for years, and yet they're still using it. So for those guys, stay in the LTS versions, the long-term support, long support versions. Okay. Now, so this means starting with JDK 9, you can now download open JDK binaries from Oracle. We're not saying don't use Java from Oracle anymore, just use the open JDK ones, unless you need to license them for long-term support. So we now produce them. It, really, in JDK 11, they'll reach parity. Until now, for most people, they're the same. But if you want flight recorder and mission control, you still have to use the Oracle ones. Okay. Uh, we have new features releases every six months. And let's see, what else? We're open sourcing the uh, infrastructure that we used to build. We used to build it in Oracle machines behind closed doors and just put the binaries out there. Now we're saying the whole infrastructure should be open source as well, so that other people, not just Oracle, can use the same machines to build open JDK binaries. So this is our hope, that the vast majority of users will stop grabbing the Oracle JDK from Java and go to the open JDK from Oracle. Does that sound like a tongue twister to you? But I guess it's clear now, right? Good. So what were those commercial features that now will be available in open source? Mission control and flight recorder. Those of you that were here for George's uh, session, you saw him talk about this, you know, the tools that we use to know what the JVM is doing at runtime. It's a pretty cool tool. Application class data sharing, which is the first open source feature that used to be commercial only. JDK 10, the open JDK 10 version, includes application class data sharing. Uh, if it sounds familiar, it's because we used to have class data sharing for the JDK classes. What we've added is the application in front, so now your application class data can also be shared, not just the JDK one. 
usage tracker and infrastructure, as I pointed out. We're also going for a late binding of features. Now, I did this slide in July of 2010. And you know, this was when we were doing the whole waterfall, we're gonna plan ahead of time what's going out. Check out when we're doing Jigsaw. It's part of JDK 8. It's coming out in the second half of 2012. And uh, notice this is one of the confirmed features, you know, at the bottom there. Yeah, because that's a release driver for 8. What happened in reality? JDK 8 released in March of 2014, not in the second half of 2012. And Jigsaw had to be, you know, it wasn't ready for 8. It was very painful. We had to move it to 9. And 9 itself didn't release in 2014. It released September of 2018, six months ago, almost to the date. So, you know, as anybody who's done any large project knows, this is what happens when you try to set the features first. And then, you know, real world happens. You have to do other stuff. It's not ready. So what are we doing now? Uh, if I was trying to get, you know, some clickbait, I would say JDK 9, the last major release of Java ever. And I mean that it's the last major release. We have a list of features that doesn't fit in one screen or two. Okay? And if you read through that list of features in slow motion, you will find that we have support for Unicode 8. You will also find Unicode 7. Anybody care to guess what happened there? We were done with Unicode 7, but we were not done with the release. By the time we were done and able to release JDK 9, it had been superseded. Now, of course, we had Unicode 7 ready. Why could a developer not use that sooner? We call that, you know, that's a marble stuck behind a basketball. It was being held back by Jigsaw. So, 100 plus features, last major release. After this, we are going to have, and by the way, if you want to learn more about what's in JDK 9, I'm not going to, you know, we don't have time for that. There's some screencasts about the most interesting features. And, you know, that's me at the bottom uh, explaining this change in the release model, right? Just search in your favorite engine for screencast JDK 9. Ask the experts. With JDK 10, we only have 12 features. Now, is this a regression? No. The new model doesn't change the number of features that you get in a three-year period. So we're not changing the throughput, we're changing the latency. Right? If you add all of the releases that happen in a three years, you're going to get very close to what happened with JDK 9. But the idea here is it's much easier to get into this stage by using the stairs than by climbing straight here. Right? So instead of giving you Here's a large number of features every three years. Good luck. We're going to need about a year of overlap, <laughs> right? So that people can migrate from the old one to the new one. We're saying every six months, here's something, small changes, much easier to keep up. This is much closer to the updates that we had when we had 8 update 20 to 8 update 40 to 8 update 60. How many people here noticed that there were new features on 8 updates? Anybody? How many people noticed that there were new features between 7 and 8? Or between 8 and 9? That's the difference, right? So I'm not claiming that they're going to be the same, because of course they're larger than an update release. But we hope to make it as easy as an update release to update these new uh, feature releases. Okay. JDK 11. Coming out just six months from now. And if you look at the list of features, it only has four. Now, I don't think we're going to release with just four. But to my previous point, that list will grow. It will not shrink. And stuff that's already there will not move. Of course, I say that knowing that as soon as you give it as an absolute, it's very unlikely that it will shrink or that it will move. Okay, All of those features we think are ready. Of course, we do put early access builds out there. There is a chance that one of you guys is going to find something completely broken. But, you know, we're a lot more certain of this list than we ever were of those old slides that talked about what's going to come out four years from now. Okay? Now, this also changes the early access. 
one of the things that you know, has to change via this model is, in the past, hey, I would like to try Jigsaw. Jigsaw is coming in JDK 9. Let me get the early access for JDK 9, right? And that's how I test Jigsaw. Now, of course, we have a catch-22. A feature cannot be added to a release until it's ready. A feature will not be ready until we get some feedback on it. So, of course, the obvious answer is, now we're going to have, you notice at the bottom of that, we have early access not just for the releases, but also for the major projects. So, you know, I hope this is going to make it cleaner. We used to have two different types of people grabbing early access. One is large corporations that were like, I just want to make sure that my program will work the same in the next version. I really don't care too much about the new features. I just care about backward compatibility. And therefore, you know, I'm not going to use VAR. I'm not going to use everything. I just want to test. And if something's going to break, I want time to fix it. Right? And you have the different audience, which is, I'm very excited about Project Valhalla, right? the value types. I would like to try that out. And I want to work on that one and give feedback. With the previous model, we were not doing a good service for either of those. Because if you just wanted to test things that work, this major release kept evolving and changing, and features were being added, and it was too, you know, too shifty. And if you only cared about one project, you were getting this one you know, binary that included every other project being worked for that release. So you know, we hope that this makes it a little bit cleaner. If you just want to taste whether it will work, just go to JDK 11 or 10, grab that. If you want to know about what we're working on in the future, take a look at Valhalla, Project CGC. And you can expect other early access binaries to come up here. So hopefully cleaner. Uh, this all early access, starting with JDK 10. Before then, we had them with the Oracle licenses. Now they're under GPL. Does anybody care about the licenses here? In some places, some people are very passionate. In others, it's like, as long as I can get it, I don't really care. Which ones are you? Anybody really passionate about which license style you see? Yeah, well, that's a good point, making sure you're legal. Not everybody goes to the trouble of reading that. New world, new deployment options. There's another important change, which is how do I use Java? How do I get Java in there? When Java came out 20 years ago, the most common one was Java on the browser, applets, right? But for applets to work, you get Java at the time from Sun, not from Oracle. You get your browser from Chrome, you know, from Google or Firefox or something. Right? And you get your code from the developer. And those three things rev at different speeds. And any one of them could do an update. And when everything works, you know, magic happens. And you know, everything is fantastic. And Oracle updates Java. And your applet just got better. What has happened then, though, is browsers have decided, yeah, we don't want to support NPAPI anymore, which is the API needed for applets. So that model is breaking away. That's not going to work anymore. Okay. Even if you factor in and say, I'm just going to look at Java and my code, the way it basically works now is there is one runtime on your system. That's the model, right? And all the programs share that one runtime. And every now and then, about once a quarter, Oracle says, hey, new version. I'm going to update everybody to 8U141, right? And auto update happens, and all of your programs happily now work with the new version of 8U141. And that happens every single time, right? So every now and then, it has happened. A release comes out, and hey, everybody works fine. But there is one program that doesn't work fine. Now it gets interesting. What do we do? You know, we could roll back, just have everybody go into 141. But you know, that's a security vulnerability fix thing. Do I really want to roll back? What most people did was, I'm just going to install the old one, and now I'm going to do this fantastic thing where I change the code that launched that program so that it uses that old release. All of the others now have to go to the next one. 
And it gets more interesting. I also need to have some sort of protection so that other programs don't use the old release. It's just for that little yellow one, right? And along comes Oracle and produces Java 9, which has new features. And of course, some of those programs, they're like, yeah, we want to use those new features. But others, we're not ready to go to 9. So even though the model was there's one shared runtime, which has some benefits, in the end, we ended up with uh, there's a handful of runtimes, right? And the developers have to spend, or this is more the administrators, because the developer just wrote that code at the bottom, right? They have to do some workarounds and hacks to make sure that their program doesn't run with the latest, which is what they wanted, but runs with this one specific version. So what we're proposing now is bring your own Java. Okay? When we came up with this model, Java runtime was about 70 megabytes. That used to represent about 1% or 2% of most people's hard drives, one runtime. The runtime has increased in size. Now it's like 150 megabytes. But hard drives have grown much faster than that. So 150 megabytes now is, what, 0.1% of your hard drive? Right? New model is you can tie every application to its own runtime. And if you do that, then the runtime is not visible to anybody else, and you're Application you know, doesn't get updated, may not break. So that's one option. You can still use the previous model, of course. But in order to make this easier with Java 9, we introduce something called JLink and the module system. We create a tool that, you know, that's the, the important tab is the, 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 the red stuff. We can create a custom runtime, optimized for your program. So, with Jigsaw, we modularized the whole JDK, and we broke apart what used to be this monolithic, this is the Java runtime, to this is a collection of modules with interdependencies. So say, you know, these are just the Java IC modules. We actually ship more than these. There's the JDK modules and others, but for, you know, to illustrate my point, imagine that you write a program that just happens to rely on two modules. So that's all you need, right? Of course, those modules rely on other modules. There's some dependency between modules. But now your program only needs the stuff that's color-coded. Everything else isn't needed. Now, I used to have to carry it around because with a shared runtime, I don't know what the other program is going to need. So I cannot trim anything out. I may break that other program. Now, I use JLink, and I can create a custom runtime. I strip out all of the modules that I don't need. At this point, we can only go as low as modules. Perhaps in the future, we'll make it even smaller. And you know, like get rid of the classes that you don't need. But you know, it's a step in the right direction. And here's another subtlety that some of you may have missed. Notice that the application is inside the bubble. So your own application is also included in the image. right? So if we go back to my previous example, with JDK 9 and later, I can have smaller runtimes that have been optimized for that one application. They're smaller, and they include the application. So I encourage you to go and take a look at that option if you like to deploy using this new model. Uh, the applications no longer look like a Java application. They look like a native program. It has its cons, of course. Now you have to update. You know, if you want to update the runtime, you have to repackage the whole thing and send it again. But if you're doing something like Docker images on which you were creating a new container anyways, this is probably something worth looking into. Okay? George pointed out, we do, you know, this improves uh, security. Uh, the most notable use case is, hey, there was a vulnerability in one of the modules that I threw away. I don't have to worry about it. Right? And um, we don't share runtimes anymore. So updating the runtime will not break any application. Right? It comes with the application. You can also look into um, the head of time compilation. So um, you know Java, interpreted language. It runs and it creates the proper machine code at runtime, right? which lets us optimize for your current situation. 
right? So if you have more memory, you can actually end up with a slightly different machine instructions that you have less memory. So that's good, but sometimes I don't want that. I want to create the, you know, like that compilation ahead of time. I don't want to do it dynamically. If you want to do that, you can now use the AOT Java compiler and create a custom runtime that already has the compilation. Now, when you do this, here's a trick though. Don't forget that you have to do this on the machine on which you want to run, not on the machine on which you developed. Because the code will be optimized for whichever machine you do this on. So if you develop on a machine with very little memory, you may not get the proper optimizations for a large system later. So you know, that's a pro tip. People mistake that AOT, they think they can do it in their own little machine, deploy that. It doesn't work quite like that. You could, it's just not gonna be as efficient. Um, that's what I had for the release model. So we have several other sessions where you can ask the experts questions about JDK 9, JDK 10. Uh, I strongly recommend going to Alex Buckley's session about what's here, what's next. Uh, these, if you weren't here, this session would have been longer and I would have tried to cover some of his information, but he does a much better job than I do in talking about that one. So with that, I'm hoping that you have some questions that I can address. Okay, so one of the questions that I have is, you said that you've eliminated Java EE out of the distribution. I'm just going to power back and see how is that being released. That's the beauty of the animations. Here we go. JDK 11, the third one. Remove Java EE and Corba modules. So the JDK used to include modules that were not part of the Java AC specification. They were part of the Java EE specification. Um, you can still have them as separate modules. They just don't ship with the JDK anymore. You have a preview of that because the Java EE modules were disabled by default in JDK 9. So if you were using these modules and you try to use JDK 9, it'll say, yeah, class not known. You can toggle them back on in JDK 9 and JDK 10 if you just pass a parameter, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but that's probably the most common issue that we've found, right? I tried to run in nine, it blew up in my face. Here's the error. Yeah, it's because you were using an EE module. You pass this parameter, you're good. But this is a red flag that you will have a problem with JDK 11. For JDK 11, you'll have to include the modules from EE directly. Don't expect them to be there from the JDK. So then the other question is, how would the release cycle for the Java EE modules relate to the JDK release cycle? And the answer is, I have no idea. You know, we do the Java SE release model, right? When we co-bundle stuff that we don't produce, there's always this lag, right? We grab the current version at some point, and we include that in the JDK. And then the other thing may release with an update even before we do. So there's always a bit of a lag. That's one of the reasons why we don't want to ship stuff that you should grab directly from some other provider. We don't want to. Thank you. Any? Right. The question is how AOT works. Uh, it, okay, so the idea of doing ahead of time compilation, it would still run on the JVM. It'll just, you know, that the JVM right now loads your class, runs a C1 compiler, which is pretty fast. If the class runs long enough, it'll, it'll re-optimize using a C2 compiler, but it'll continue running the JVM. So ahead of time allows you to sit, do those steps ahead of time and jump straight to that the code has been optimized. It'll still be run by the JVM, it's not native code, it won't turn it into C. But the whole part of warm up, if you will, can be saved. At the cost of, it's no longer optimized in real time, it's optimized for whenever you did the AOT. Now, AOT is experimental, I believe in nine or eight, I'm not, you know, they start to get muffled. Um, 
right now it works only for the Java classes, not for your code in supported mode, experimental for everything that's your code. Eventually, you'll be able to just AOT your whole application and the runtime parts that you need. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is there any performance issues with this? And the answer is maybe, right? So AOT is a choice. Um, either you optimize at runtime, which has the benefits of it's optimized for what is currently going on on your system right now, but you pay the penalty of having to warm up the, the JVM, or you do it ahead of time, you save the warm up, but you lose the optimization. Uh, like most things, you know, like should I do parallel, should I do serial? The answer is you should probably try both with a stopwatch <laughs> and see, you know, do you want to optimize for resource usage or for speed? So there's so many variables that nobody can reasonably tell you. And you know, we can give you rule of thumbs, but it's up to you to decide that. Okay. Got a question? Okay, the question, and I'm not going to be able to paraphrase the whole thing, but uh, is JLink going to give me some advantages, you know, for the long term on containers, or may they even supersede the need for use in containers? And JLink and containers are probably complementary. So it just happens to be that containers is a common use case on which you don't have common dependencies. And that's the kind of situation that JLink will help you with. You're trying to create, instead of a common runtime and a bunch of applications connected to it, single runtime. When you do that, you know, I'm even careful to say, you no longer have what I call a Java runtime. This new image will not be able to run every Java program. It'll be able to run your Java program. Technically, or any other that only uses the classes that you choose to use, right? Module. So, I don't foresee JLink superseding the need for containers. By the way, they address different needs. They just place nicely with each other very well. And I don't foresee containers going away <laughs> anytime soon or anything like that. If anything, it's probably more likely that we will move to a model where continuous delivery, continuous integration using containers will be the norm rather than the exception. I don't know how long though, and it depends on each. Okay, so the question is, how would JLink deal with dependencies that are not just your code? You have Java E or, or Hibernate. Well, the answer is they're still Java. So as long as they have been modularized, JLink will be able to use them anyways. Now, you can use JLink on a non-modular application. The way it works now is if you wrote your application as a modular application, you can just say, hey, JLink, here's my application. Here's the mods, JMods, they're, they ship with the JDK, which is you know, like the, the modules that come with the JDK. You figure it out. And you look at your application and it'll say, oh, since you modularize it, I know which modules you need. I can build an image that contains that for you. You could grab an application that has not been modularized and manually say, JLink, create an image that contains all of these modules. And if you get that right, it'll also create a runtime that you can use to launch your application. It's just more work for you and more error prone. Uh, likewise, you know, you can certainly write a program using reflection that will work on a full JDK and failed on a modularized uh, JLink option if you call something that, you know, wasn't called out and it was just generated at runtime. Does that answer your question? Got three minutes. Any other questions?
Right, so the question is, uh, we've made some improvements to Java running on a container. At a high level, the difference is uh, JDK usually optimizes based on the memory and the processors that are available on your system. And what most people running containers want is to have it optimized to the memory and processors assigned to the container. Uh, before, you could pass parameters and say, limit you know, the memory to this or limit the, the CPUs to this number of CPUs. The improvements that we're making it is so that by default, it behaves as if it was running on a machine with the, you know, recognizing the constrained number of CPUs or memory. That has been backported, some of it, I think the memory one, I'm sorry, the CPUs one, has been backported all the way to eight. There's further enhancements in that same uh, idea that are enhancements that are probably going to go into JDK 11. Um, as they are not ready, you don't see them yet on the JDK 11 page, but if they're ready for September of this year, they'll be there for 11. If not, 12 or 13, 14, whenever they're ready. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, if, if you don't pass the, the, the proper flags to the versions that don't figure it out for you, it'll just, you know, it'll hog memory or processors because it'll, it'll assume that it has the whole machine, which is what it was meant to do. Sure, no problem. Okay, my recommendation for the upgrades from six to eight or nine. Now, remember when I said that Java 9 was the last major release. I do expect that you will have to have some work to go between major releases. Now, 7 to 8 was, well, 6 to 7, eh, there was a lot of work being done on 7, you know, since 6 was out for such a long time. Right? It shouldn't be that painful. 7 to 8 should be almost seamless. I haven't heard of any major complaints between 7 to 8. It's only good news. 9 represents an inflection point, because with 9, there's some change in the list of supported platforms. For example, we no longer do 32 bits. We no longer do ARM. Um, and some of the internal APIs that were meant to be used by the JDK to implement the official APIs, right? People were relying on the internal APIs. With Jigsaw, we have the option of hiding those. And I can produce uh, you know, archives of Sun pages from 95 telling developers, don't use the internal APIs. Show of hands, how many people think people actually follow that advice and didn't use the internal APIs? Yeah. Um, even if you were very diligent in not using internal APIs, libraries and frameworks weren't as diligent, and whatever vice or virtue is available in the library that you choose, your program now has that vice or virtue. So there's a bunch of people that rely on internal APIs because they use log4j, right? Uh, going from anything prior to 9 to 9 or above will probably run you into that problem. Having said that, in this new model, going from 9 to 10, it's really very small. Going from 10 to 11, really very small. So as long as you keep up, you're not going to have to do that big jump that I said at the beginning. You're only going to have small steps. What I recommend is, even if your intention is to stay only on the long-term support options, always you know, check your code against the current one. And if there's any tweaking that needs to be done, do that at that time. That way you'll see everything in small, you know, easily chewable pieces six months apart, as opposed to finding these large number of changes every three years. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm sorry, we had some noise in the back, and I think we're on time, so I understand if anybody needs to, you know, like, bolt out and go, I don't know if we have lunch after this or anything, but if you can repeat your question, I'll try to address it. Correct. And uh, what we recommend is always try to compile your first 
try to run your old code on the new one without even recompiling, right? Most cases that'll work. The next step is try to compile the new code with the new version, your old code with the new version of the JDK. Um, our modus operandi is we try not to break people without a warning. So you might see warnings when you're compiling in nine, that means it won't work on 10, okay? If you skip that part and just go from nine to 11, you may see things break without warning, okay? Or if you ignore, whenever you're running and you do something that we think it's silly, we'll, we'll print a log and say, you shouldn't be doing that. Most people that I speak to, they're like, yeah, yeah, we ignore that. They're like, sorry about then not giving you warnings if you ignore the warnings, right? Okay, well, thank you then. Um, I'm gonna take a